Welcome, folks. Welcome. It's great to see folks that are joining. I see Sephora, Henry. Okay. Well, we've got all of our panelists here today. Uh, we're really grateful to have everyone um, on the call with us this morning for the uh, next webinar in our series. We're going to go ahead and get started, and folks can just continue to put your uh, your name and where you're calling in from into the chat. Uh, my name is Alicia Lueras Maldonado, and I'm really happy to be moderating today's conversation along with um, the Building Movement Project. I, I do work with them as a consultant um, based here in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and Tiwa land. Um, so welcome, all of you. Uh, big uh, you know, thanks to the panelists that have joined us today, uh, Representative Javier Martinez, Representative Cristina Ortez, County Commissioner Adrienne Barboa, who I'm happy to say are all longtime friends and colleagues whose work um, I greatly admire uh, and all the work that they've done. So thank you all for, for joining us today. Really grateful and appreciate you. So a couple of housekeeping uh, notes as we move through. Uh, the attendees are not visible. Uh, again, let's utilize this chat to send questions to the panelists. Uh, any tech issues you can um, send to BMP admin. That's Catherine Foley. She's part of our Building Movement Project team. And I want to give her a huge shout out for all of the tech support and helping me with the presentation materials and promotion and just really uh, being there for anything that uh, I needed to help get this together. So thank you, Catherine, for all of your support. Uh, please feel free to tweet POC leaders and building power. Um, and this webinar is being recorded, and we'll share the link along with additional materials afterwards. So for today's agenda, we're going to share a little bit of our BNP research and report findings from some of the uh, reports and surveys that we've done in the past. We'll introduce our panelists, and then we will move into our conversation with our um, leaders of color today. So a little bit about the Building Movement Project. Uh, Building Movement Project is a national resource organization and we're focused on developing resources and tools to support and challenge the nonprofit organizations to be more focused and committed to progressive social change. And there's three areas uh, in which we do this work. So moving from left to right, uh, one, we do movement building, looking at how organizations collaborate and work together to have a bigger impact than they would on their own. Two. Uh, service and social change. So developing the capacity of human services to engage constituents in addressing the root causes of the conditions that they're facing. And three, leadership, looking at how nonprofits can promote effective and inclusive practices. And I'm happy to say that I've been able to engage with the three panelists uh, in a variety of ways uh, through this particular work in these three different areas. So Thank you all for your past support and contributing um, to the surveys that we have put out, um, as well as uh, being advisors to the work that we do here in New Mexico. So first off, I wanted to just share um, a little bit about what we did in uh, 2020. So in 2020, we had a report from Building Movement Project and Solidarity Is. Uh, and this was the um, report that was released on COVID and in particular, impact on leaders of color. And so this was a um, survey that was released nationally, and we did have a subset of data from folks in New Mexico. So there were over 400 nonprofit leaders of color that responded. Um, there were key findings that we reported, uh, testimonials and quotes, and recommendations for philanthropy, nonprofits, and the government. So some of the key findings that we want to share, and we did uh, do uh, two webinars so far on this particular report. We did one back in October, um, and we had uh, three leaders from New Mexico on that. And then we invited them back uh, to uh, do a webinar with us back in March. And so we had the same three folks join us along with an additional panelist. So the key findings from On the Front Lines report is that the crisis is about to get worse before it gets better. Nonprofits are making up for government inefficiencies, and I'm sure that you all can speak to this, and we can get into that later in the conversation. The climate is taking an immense toll on P 
POC leaders, and in particular, women of color. The long-term financial stability of POC nonprofits is at stake, and it's time for systemic change and solidarity across the board. Additionally, we also released a report um, from our Race to Lead um, survey that we had done. And this was data that we collected from over 5,000 nonprofit staff from across the country. So it was a much bigger set of, um, of uh, participants and, and reporting. We were able to really dig deep into the data and list out a number of key findings. Additionally, we had testimonials and quotes. Um, and recommendations and opportunities for change within philanthropy and the sector. Normally, we would do these report backs in person, and in the past, we've hosted them in Albuquerque and Santa Fe. Uh, we did this uh, particular uh, webinar last year um, via Zoom. So again, the key findings from the Race to Lead revisited, um, which was in 2017, right? Uh, but we have found that the findings are still very relevant uh, three years later. So there's a definite white advantage within the nonprofit sector in terms of upward mobility, leadership, access to funding, uh, a number of issues that, uh, that were raised uh, in the findings of this report. Uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? Those are like the, the, the big, you know, keywords that we're seeing, uh, you know, listed up and used throughout the sector. But we're finding that folks are saying that there's uncertainty about their effectiveness, how they're being implemented, what it really means. Um, and so really looking at how we get past um, just the language and look at how things are actually implemented and are benefiting uh, in particular people of color within the nonprofit sector. So um, that's a little bit about the report that, um, that we have done in the last couple of years here in New Mexico. So again, um, the nonprofit racial leadership gap in New Mexico, a race to lead brief, was released in September of 2020. Uh, we did the webinar in September of 2020 to discuss those results. And then we've done two webinars on the effects of leaders of color, COVID-19 and the effects of leaders of color. Um, so again, we're really grateful for everyone that tuned in for those. If you go to buildingmovementproject.org, all of the um, data, the reports, as well as the YouTube video recordings and blog posts and tools are all on there. So we invite you to, to take a look um, at our website. So I want to introduce our amazing panelists. Uh, I'm really honored um, that, that you three have taken the time to, to join us today. I know that your schedules are incredibly busy, that you're running from meeting to meeting or from Zoom to Zoom. And so I just can't express enough my gratitude uh, to all of you for taking the time. So today we have the pleasure of talking with Adrienne Barboa. She's a county commissioner here in Bernalillo for District 3. And she's also the policy director for Forward Together. Uh, Javier Martinez is the New Mexico state rep for District 11. And he's the executive director of Partnership for Community Action. And our third panelist is Christina Ortez. She's a new uh, New Mexico State Representative from District 42 and is the Executive Director of the Taos Land Trust. So my interest in talking with these three folks in particular is that they have an immense background of doing community organizing and advocacy as leaders within the nonprofit sector and decided to throw their hat into um, public office and run for office and are now all elected leaders. And so we want to get into a discussion today around that. Uh, but before we do that, I wanted to share just a little bit about each of our panelists uh, and then we'll move into our conversation. So Adrienne Barboa uh, is, is uh, someone that I am so thrilled. I have known Adrienne for, I think, over 20 years now. <laughs> and uh, it's just been a pleasure to see uh, her work um, over the years and how she has navigated community organizing, uh, advocacy, uh, doing work with, with young folks, uh, passing legislation to support pregnant and parenting young folks, um, has done work on reproductive health, mobilizing community, um, and pioneered Forward, to, uh, Forward Together's first uh, state-based program, which is now Strong Families New Mexico. 
So she has uh, been committed to this work uh, for many, many years and is now a county commissioner in District 3. So uh, thank you, uh, Adrienne, for all of your work over the years. Um, our next panelist is uh, Javier Martinez, and he is, um, as I said, the, the uh, state representative for District 11 here in Albuquerque. Um, he has been a, a tireless advocate for New Mexico communities for over a decade. Um, it, it, as his work in the legislature, he has served on the House Taxation and Revenue Committee, uh, as well as on the House Commerce and Economic Development Con uh, Committee, mm -hmm. and really uh, works on government transparency, early education, and renewable energy, as well as being the Executive Director for Partnership for Community Action, which is a nonprofit uh, here in the South Valley in Albuquerque. Uh, I drive by it every day when I'm going down to Sleta and just excited to see the new developments. I wanna hear about some of the stuff you all are doing, including that incredible building that's going up. Uh, and then just the amazing work that you have done uh, for working families, uh, as a negotiator, as a consensus builder uh, here in New Mexico. So thank you, Javier. And We've got Christina Ortez, who is a newly elected state rep uh, up in northern New Mexico, up in Taos, and has committed uh, her work towards the protection of New Mexico's land, water, and investing in families. Um, she was elected in November of 2020. And although she says she's not a career politician, she has always worked <laughs> in service to her community um, and has really focused on resolving land and water issues in communities. She's been in Taos for 10 years um, and has served as the executive director of the Taos Land Trust for five years. Um, she's an advocate uh, that's drafting legislation uh, and advocated for public lands and clean water at the state and national levels. So thank you, all of you. And um, we're going to get into our discussion. So I wanted to start off with a question for you all. You've been longtime uh, advocates uh, and organizers who decided to run for office. And so I wanted to ask you, what made you decide to take this journey? And I wanted to start off with uh, Christina and, um, and get your story in terms of what was it that, that brought you into this? Thank you so much, Alicia, Building Movement Project, my panelists, it's so nice to see you, Representative Martinez, Adrienne, Commissioner Barboa, uh, and everybody who's on the other side watching. Uh, that is an excellent question that I keep asking myself every day. <laughs> how, did I, how did I get here? Um, how do I stay here? Uh, it's, uh, it, it is uh, something I deliberate uh, all the time, but I think the the, the two reasons for me being where I am now in my work and, you know, as a newly elected legislator really are, are my daughters, Vida, who's seven, and Gillian, who is 10. They both, um, you know, I asked them for permission when I even started to contemplate the possibility of running for office. And that, that's a story that's, I think, probably better enjoyed over some beverages. It's a long one lots of deliberation up and down, you know, but it's, you know, when you're, when you're finally called, right, you need to check in with yourself and with your family uh, about, you know, whether or not you can take that call and take that step, right, but my daughters, you know, um, I, I think of, I think of all the decisions I was making in, when I was in my you know, teens and 20s, particularly around, you know, my own ability to choose my, you know, my own health care, my own reproductive health care. And I thought about what their decisions would be and where we were, you know, last year and two years ago in this you know, challenging position of whether or not, you know, we could protect the reproductive rights, healthcare rights for our, for our daughters. And I, that's really what prompted me to, to, you know, to, to do this. Uh, and so I started on that journey. I'd been an advocate for a long time. I'd been an environmental advocate for 17 years now, you know, and when you're an organizer in the field, you're, you're, you know, you're on the front line working directly with decision makers, right? All of us know that we've all been doing that. Uh, and, you know, we, you know, we imagine, think, you know, think 10 years ago when you're 
getting people in your community to write letters or make phone calls to field staff. Like, you know, I've been doing that, right? So, you know, I, I always thought of myself as that person who would be organizing people to make, you know, and helping to draft legislation, never, you know, being the person to decide on that legislation. So uh, I, it's, it's kind of strange that, that I never thought of myself as that, but it's just, that was the case. But when I got to the point of being called to serve, Right. I, you know, I thought back about I thought back to all of the the points at which I'd been an active in community, you know, asking people to join me in a cause to protect, you know, to protect you know, certain public land or or, you know, on on a secchia work funding for secchias. And, and I realized that, you know, we're all just we're all just working together to fight this fight, right? And so it really does help as an elected as, as an elected person if you have been doing the work in community. You understand. You understand, mm -hmm. you know, the issues mm -hmm. that we're facing. So I did it for my daughters. I continue to do it for them, even though they would rather me be um, an owner of the Rocky Mountain Chocolate Factory. That's what <laughs> a seven-year-old would well, prefer. <laughs> yes, I would prefer that too, because then you could send us treats. Mm -hmm. I would. Thank you for would sharing that, Christina. I wanted to uh, move to Adrienne and, uh, you know, get your story. And also, if you could share, you know, what what does it mean to balance both roles, right? Like in the, non, the nonprofit work and then being, you know, in public office, what that journey is like. And we can double back to this again, too, Christina, because I see you nodding your head, right? But uh, something to think about. So, Adrienne, uh, if you could share with us your journey and, and in particular, sort of what that is like. Yeah, no, um, thank you, and um, ditto all the things Christina so gracefully said, Rep Ortiz, thankful she get to say that now. Um, I am Commissioner Adrienne Barboa from Bernalillo County District 3, and I um, really always say that I've been an organizer since I was a really young person myself, um, and I actually feel like I was blessed to be trained by with the best. Um, like Alicia said, we've known each other for a really long time and been in a lot of the same kind of organizing camps. Um, but um, in along that journey, being able to actually find and build the resources to bring hundreds, if not thousands of people to their decision makers, like in my work at Ford Together, we say one of our major roles is to shorten the distance between decision makers and the people that they represent. And in that role, I've been able to, along my lifetime of doing that work, been able to bring the resources and the skill set and um, engage community to where I've been able to bring hundreds, if not thousands of people to the decision makers that represent them and still oftentimes met without much change or seeing that, in my view, from bringing folks from their, their constituents and not always seeing the change that community fights so hard for. Um, so part of so that was really my sort of decision to run was that we need to be everywhere um, and we need to I'm sorry somebody keeps calling me I'll turn off the thing um, yeah we need to be everywhere and we need all approaches we need to be in from every angle um, some of the work around balancing it um, when I got to say I, I don't know how our reps do it I do have a paid staff at, at my county role um, as commissioner, and I was just telling my, um, you know, operations assistant that I think I would be drowning if it wasn't, and uh, if it wasn't for that support. So I do think there's just all these different roles and how we play, and which are year long, or you know, um, what it, what does it look like, and and having an unpaid state legislature. Um, but I definitely um, both that both the role one that I have this staff support I feel like I need at the county and then that my organization board together has always been ready to take some risks to take some steps to open up and 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 see what can we do where and how are we building power and um, so they've really allowed me that room and space um, and and been also a support to me almost in mentoring or advice um, as to how I navigate and making sure I'm doing everything ethically <laughs> um, so yeah, it's been it's been those um, sort of dual roles and really feeling like I had um, pretty good support for both both spaces. Thank you, Adrienne. 
Javier, I wanted to turn it over to you. And I wanted to ask as you think about this journey, right? And, you know, if you could think about uh, sharing, like, what, what are some of the challenges that you face? And once you're in elected office, you know, uh, how do you determine both roles? And then how do, how do you determine, like, who are you still accountable to, right? Because all of you come from community. Um, and then something to think about for all of you as we continue, like, what in particular is this like to be a leader of color, right, um, uh, in elected uh, office and then in the work that you do? So, Javier, if you could share with us your thoughts. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you, Alicia, and, and Building Movement Project for the invitation. And it's great to see uh, Rep. Ortiz and Commissioner Barboa on this call as well. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a difficult balance. Um, and in, in the New Mexico legislature in particular, because of what Commissioner Barboa mentioned earlier, you know, we are a volunteer operation. We don't have staff. Uh, even during the session is when we have a little bit of staff and Rep. Ortiz will know that she actually has to share an admin assistant with another legislator. Um, I, I have, a, I have a, a little bit of a leg up these days because as a chairperson, I, I get to have like two or three analysts that work for me, but only during sessions. So I always joke with constituents, if somebody has an exemplary, awesome idea during this call today, don't expect me to move on it right away because I've got to like delegate to hopefully somebody who will help me out. I, I don't, we don't have staffers year round. Um, so it's, it's a tough balance, you know, um, and keep in mind folks, uh, I don't know how many of you on this call are from out of state, but New Mexico is actually the only remaining volunteer legislature, believe it or not. And it sounds beautiful. It's a citizen legislature. It's so romantic, uh, but it's a real detriment, I think, to, to advancing policies in the state that can really have a meaningful impact on families. Um, so so it's, it's, a, it's a tough balancing act in that regard. Um, I also think that for, for, for us who come from the organizing world, who come from um, community move, movement building organizations, um, you know, we are accountable not only to our constituents, I, I believe we're accountable to constituencies everywhere. We're accountable to people who uh, see in us agents of change, who see in us, uh, who see us as an extension of that movement building work that's been happening long before we, you know, we got involved in this work, you know, 15, 20 years ago. Um, and, and so it's, it's, uh, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a delicate balance. Now, uh, I, I, I will say this, right? I, and I tell all my organizing colleagues and friends this, hold us accountable every step of the way, but also, we've got to understand the limitations, both of the nonprofit sector in movement building work and of specific legislators or politicians. Uh, you know, we've got our own limitations. And so it is that, that middle space, that middle ground, and I'm not talking ideologically, I'm just talking sort of where everything kind of meets. Um, I think that that's really uh, the challenge for us over the next few years. How do we occupy that middle space? And how do we harness that energy and that accountability and that passion to move positions and to move policies uh, forward. Thank you, Javier, for sharing that. And thank all of you for, you know, sharing with us a little bit about your journey. Before we get into the next round of questions that are going to really focus on, you know, what you all did this past legislative session and what you're currently working on within um, your public office and, and uh, within the work that you're doing, we wanted to run a quick poll. Uh, for our audience members to participate in. And so I'm going to invite Catherine to uh, go ahead and put the poll up. So what are your most pressing concerns right now? Uh, and there are uh, the options there. And you can go ahead and select that. We'll give you all a couple of minutes. Alisa, do we get to vote too? Yeah, you should. Do you see it? That's not like yeah. the poll for committee. For committee hearings, we're not allowed to <laughs> participate. Yes, we can all participate. I just voted also. Mm -hmm. I'll pick all of the above. Right. So I think we'll be generating uh, the responses here in just a minute. 
As we're waiting, Christina, did you have anything to add in terms of, you know, the balancing act <laughs> that I asked and sort yeah. of the accountability yeah. factor before we move on as we're waiting for I the results talk to come about, in? Yeah, for sure. I want to talk about balance in that there really is not any. Um, that's <laughs> it. I mean, I, uh, I think it's surrender. Really, that's when I when I accepted that. Uh, it was much easier for me to manage the legislative session and taking care of my daughters during COVID with the help of my mother. I would not have been able to do it without her and, you know, trying to run a nonprofit at the same time. But, um, and I don't want to sound too cheesy, but I don't care about that. Um, you know, I've been in therapy for like 25 years. Everybody needs to be in therapy all the time. And my therapist says to me that if you want to, you can't get all of it done, right? You just can't. So don't even try. Don't like try to prove yourself to anybody because it's just not worth it. You will kill yourself and nobody wants you dead. So you should do these three things. You should prioritize, you should simplify, and you must ask for help. And I literally write that down everywhere I go. You know, it's like all over my home and, you know, it's my mantra because when Things start getting real and they get real every single day, all the time. I just, I look at that. I'm like, oh, all right, this is the time to ask for help. Or, you know, I can't do that. And I just can't do that because there's just one of me. And that's all there is to it. So prioritize, simplify, ask for help, period. And don't try to do everything yourself. Ask for help. Ask your mother. Ask your Thea. Ask Adrienne, you know. And she'll ask someone else because she can't do it all either. And neither can Javier, Right. I think that's such an important thing, Christina, and I think what all three of you have lifted up is, you know, the enormous burdens that are placed on leaders of color, right, to sort of manage it all, families, work, you know, fundraising, policy, and, you know, one of the things that was lifted up in the webinar that we did um, on COVID-19 was it, it, it really allowed folks to kind of step back for a second to think about, like, wellness within themselves and within their community and within their organizations and really um, prioritizing self-wellness in order to then be able to do the community work. And so I think that's hugely important. And we're not often, we don't often give ourselves permission to do that or we're not given permission to do that. So um, I think that, uh, I thank you all for, for sharing that um, and just really lifting up that, that it is a struggle, right? And that we do need help. Uh, and it's okay to ask for help uh, when we need it and collaborate as need be. Uh, I think we've got the results from our poll uh, if uh, Christina wants to share them. So it looks like surveillance mm -hmm. and criminalization of communities of color and food and housing instability are tied at 48%. Uh, so those are things that are really on folks' minds as well as, you know, some close ones, water in the environment is, is at 40%. Um, you know, there's, there's lots, of, lots of concerns here uh, and things that, um, that folks are still thinking about. So thank you all for sharing. Uh, again, continue to drop into the chat as you join our call. We're gonna move into the next round of questions. Uh, and I'd love for all of you to share with us some of the work that you did uh, during the past legislative session. Um, and you know, what were some of the successes? What, what were some disappointments or challenges? And then we had a question here from one of our uh, participants um, that legislators have certain agendas that are important. Uh, once elected, these agendas might not be important to the collective legislative body. What have been some challenges that you face? Uh, what were some uh, important issues that you weren't able to get consensus on? So let's have a conversation now about some of the work that you all were engaged in. Uh, and Adrienne, I know that you were hugely engaged as an advocate, uh, but feel free to also share with us some of the stuff you're working on at the county level as well. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and ask uh, Javier to start us off on this one. Sure. Thank you. You know, we had a we had a great session this year. Um, you know, we we uh, we passed a, a very strong, I believe, a very strong budget uh, that really I think continues to double down on the investments in public ed in early childhood. Uh, uh, parallel to the early childhood work, we finally were able to pass House Joint Resolution One, uh, which there was a question in the chat box uh, that you just mentioned, and that's really like the issue that got me motivated to run for state house uh, seven years ago. Uh, it was the inability of the legislature to pass what I thought was a slam dunk 
uh, for New Mexico's children that really motivated me to go. Uh, we got that done finally. Um, we got the Civil Rights Act passed, uh, becoming only the second state, I believe, to end qualified immunity uh, for state actors, including police. Uh, you know, I want to lift up uh, Speaker Brian Egoff and, and, and uh, his chief of staff, Rina Shapansky, uh, for really, I mean, my goodness, uh, they carried the weight of that piece of legislation, um, along with Representative Georgian Lewis, uh, in an incredible, incredible way. And, and uh, you know, when we have more time, I'll, I'll share the story of how Speaker Egoff uh, really just put that whole thing together uh, almost a year ago. We were, we were on our way to a special session in June uh, during the pandemic. George Floyd had just been murdered um, and state government was focused on COVID relief and really not thinking at all about what had happened to George Floyd and what has happened for the last genera you know, several generations in our communities. Um, and Speaker Egoff took that issue and really just made it happen. Um, we had one of the biggest tax relief bills in the history of the state pass with a $110 million a year tax break for working families, for working people, for low-income families, low-income seniors, including undocumented workers, becoming only the second state in the country to open up our, uh, our working families tax credit to undocumented workers. Huge, huge deal that really flew under the radar, but that really was a, a huge policy victory. Um, uh, there are a host of other bills that I think uh, deserve mention. I know uh, Report Best carried some of them as well. Uh, but look, you know, getting elected, back to the question, right, from the chat box, getting elected is like not even half the battle. It's like in a tiny little percentage of the battle. Uh, building that consensus is really key. And you build that consensus. Uh, uh, and I know that this is like the sort of dirty word, you know, elephant in the room sometimes in our communities, but it's fundraising. And we need fundraising because our elections are not publicly financed. And so you have to compete against other people who have a lot of money from different interests. And so, uh, again, I want to uplift uh, Rina Shapansky and Speaker Egoff and Leanne Leith, who's the political director of the, of the House Democratic Campaign Committee, because they put together an operation that not only has, for the last five years, been electing progressive people, they've been actually recruiting, developing, and electing progressive uh, uh, people of color, women of color. Uh, our, our chamber now is majority female, um, and thanks in large part to that leadership uh, of, of the speaker and Rena and, and Leanne. Um, and, you know, some of you on this call might be getting a call from me tonight or in the next few days about fundraising, about contributing, because we need to do that. And again, it's not sexy. It's not fun for people who come from a good government perspective, calling any in interest, whether it's the environmental interest or the financial interest or whatever interest might be is difficult, but that's the, you know, as an organizer, I'm pragmatic. I know my two co colegas here are as well. That's the, that's the playing field we're in. We've got to work to build, fix it. We've got to work to rebuild it. But until then, that's the game we're in. And so we've got to be able to switch those hats uh, with ease. Otherwise, we will be progressive elected officials of color who are there for symbolic purposes only. And that's not why we sacrifice what we sacrifice uh, uh, to do. You know, we're not there just to be symbols. We're there to be actors that are active who are gonna bring results to our communities. Thank you, Javier. Christina, your thoughts on- Oh my God. You know, that was, share, that share with so us what you're working on and yeah. yeah. Um, challenges, was just what worked, what didn't. So many challenges, so many things, but thank you. Representative Martinez, that was beautiful. That's that. That's it, right? And he just gave a masterclass on all the things that that we have to do. And I'm so proud as a freshman. Uh, this this election cycle, this this legislative session was bonkers, right? I'm so grateful for you know for the leadership and for folks like Representative Martinez for helping me, texting me, you know, while I, you know, I've never really debated before. I hadn't run for office since like 1990, really, truly, student body president. So I didn't, you know, I didn't know how to do really any of those things. I know how to talk about the things that I care about, but when, but debating is a whole different scenario, right? So uh, 
uh, what what I learned was that you know you've really you know got to just open yourself up to the criticism and use it quickly, incorporate it, and and keep moving forward. And I'm grateful to be part of this class of folks that decriminalized abortion. You know, with HB seven, that was you know I I, I that was really my answer to why uh, you know what inspired you. It was a phone call from someone who might be on this. Uh, Zoom right now from Rachel Cox saying, hey, you need to do this. So, and these are the reasons why you need to do this so that we can, we can get rid of this stupid law. Uh, so that happened, the end of life options. You know, I'm just, I'm proud to be part of this legislation that moved our families forward. From my perspective, you know, I did a lot of legislation that was on related to land and water, environmental issues. Um, and I was able to get two bills, uh, signed by the governor, which was pretty exciting. Uh, I, I uh, saw the sad death of two bills on the Senate side because of, I don't know, inertia, lack of understanding, lack of interest. And that made me really, really sad. I'm not dogging my Senate colleagues, but, you know, we do a lot of good things in the House. And it's really sad to put so much work into something and then see it, that people need and want and then to see it just languish because there's no time so that, you know, I was really, really, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't want to seem like I, you know, sour grapes, but, you know, I, I think we did a lot of good stuff on COVID, but we, our families need a lot more help and we need to work harder to make sure that, that families, working families and singles, I got to be careful about that, working folks, uh, you know, have more uh, hands, you know, money in their pocket so that they can, you know, they can be, they can thrive. And that's what I'd like to see us do, you know, going forward is really focus on that. And I'm so honored and proud to be part of, you know, the legislators that voted for HJR1. Oh my God. Oh my God. You know, my children, the reason why I'm working and I'm doing this is because of high quality early childhood education. And we need more of that. And everybody needs to have access to that. So thank you. Thank you for that being your motivating factor, Representative Martinez, and for pushing it for so long. Thank you, Christina. And I just appreciate all of you and your honesty. So, you know, it's challenging stuff. It's, it's not all roses, and I, I appreciate the conversation. Adrienne, uh, share with us uh, what was going on during the session and what you're working on currently. Yeah, so, and as my role as policy director for Ford together, um, our, our, you know, we been, um, as a reproductive justice organization, been leading on the fight for to repeal the abortion ban. So, um, and we were so proud of um, Representative Christina Artez's um, work, even before running as a candidate, to bring along and show that the voices of Northern New Mexicans are with us. I think that is some of the work I've been most proud of that I've gotten to do as a policy director is really depolarizing the issue of um, and hopefully chipping away at the shame and stigma around our full spectrum of reproductive health access. Um, but, you know, interesting enough, too, that um, the other bill that I got to work on with Ford Together has been um, healthcare. We have the New Mexico Together for Healthcare campaign that I actually get to work for many years with uh, Representative Javier Martinez. Um, and we passed this healthcare affordability fund, which is going to bring over $120 million into the state, specifically to address how do we get to the place where we have true quality, affordable health care for all our families. Um, and so, and then, you know, there was so much in there around different health care bills that we worked on that um, included access for immigrant families that, you know, address some of the ways that our families are receiving health care or not receiving health care right now, mixed immigration, mixed tribal statuses. Um, those are all, have all been um, some of the ways that we've chipped away at that this session. Um, and, you know, interesting enough, our, um, for, for folks on the call that love political um, po politics and the maneuvers within, um, we were once again facing with um, trying to get the healthcare affordability fund, facing some roadblocks. And um, because we have such a seasoned and knowledgeable legislator and Representative Armstrong, one of our sponsors, um, that, you know, she was able to bring it back to life with um, a behavioral health bill. And I'm using that sort of as my segue, um, behavioral health um, because of the combination of those two bills, behavioral health um, practitioners will not have the have to pay the same tax that um, they get a tax break for their service. Um, and what led me to run for county commissioner, I talked about 
the sort of place of being wanting for us and our families and folks that are um, for communities of color, women, young single moms like myself to be better represented in our local government. Um, the the other biggest thing for me, especially for the county, has been the behavioral health. Um, if you live in Bernalillo County, you voted for a behavioral health tax dollars that brings in over $20 million a year to really address what I say is the needs that our state has been going through for a long time, right? Um, the dis-ease of drug addiction and a substance use, right? And um, I myself have lost a father and um, several uncles to alcohol and substance use. I've worked in the field of providing direct services and knowing that our county has those kind of resources, how do we make them the best to where actually re reaching to, if you grew up in New Mexico, you love somebody who suffered from that um, disease of, of, of substance use. And so I really believe that we can use those resources, not just to provide services, but to actually connect some of the dots, get to some of the root causes. Um, so that's where my focus has been on as a, that I'm trying to build in my very new seat since January, um, <laughs> as a County commissioner. So I won't, I could talk forever. So I'm trying to cut myself off. <laughs> well, we'll have some time, uh, as well at the end for, for more conversation between the, the three of you. I wanted to move into looking at the potential power of nonprofits to influence policy, right? And you all know that work from, from your own experience. And so I wanted to, to chat a little bit about, you know, what are your bold solutions, right? Whether it's in policy or philanthropy or on the movement levels. And uh, Adrienne, I know you were just chatting, but I wanted to ask you, you know, how do you go about building power within your organization as you think about the work that you do and in influencing policy? Thank you so much. I'm glad because I, I actually think I'm glad to go first on this. I think that, um, right, I talked a little a minute ago about in my several years as an organizer, I, I've learned things along the way. And, and with the, when I, it's actually been nine years now since I opened the Board together, Strong Families New Mexico office here in New Mexico. And, um, you know, some of that have, having having those years of, of like know-how and trying, and also like I talked about having a, an executive director that's willing to take risks. Um, you know, we really said, um, how are we able with the resources we have to be able to build to the kind of scale that can influence power, right? Um, and 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 but with the same values and intentionality, so we don't just become this like mill of trying to get people to take action, but that we're actually building the relationships needed. We're moving together and at the scale that we can influence power. Um, so we really, um, you know, eight years ago said, let's try working in rural New Mexico. We both saw that sometimes in rural New Mexico, there's like elections that are that I, we actually heard of elections where they had to draw straws at the end because they were a tie, a three-way tie, or seven people. This past session, we had like one though in southern New Mexico that was one of our closest champs that like by 11 people, right? Um, and so we're like, if we could actually build relationships and community where we're learning together, we're learning the process together, we're learning about the issues together, and we're moving together, then we can have a, a uh, both we can both influence power because we're able to hold accountable together, right? Because you know we can get all on one issue and still have 500 different opinions about how we should use those early childhood dollars, right? Um, but when we're able to have a, a group that moves together, so that's the way that. Um, and and I, you know, to be honest, as an elect, as a newly elected official, I keep this is one of my struggles or challenges is that I keep being in this space where like. You know, I, I and I and I feel like I'm gonna go with it because it's my strength. I'm just going. I go with my organizer role, like right, like where can I build some relationships in my district? Where can I make sure that I have people that trust me, are moving with me, understand the policies and what I'm facing, um, and so we can move together. And that's the way I'm approaching it. Sometimes I'm, because I don't see a lot of that in in among my commissioner colleagues, I'm like, huh, maybe I'm not fully leveraging my authority as a commissioner. I'm not really sure yet, still to be learned, but um, for now, those are the ways they sort of transfer over to each other. Well, I would say that what you're doing is effective in terms of 
uh, how you're leveraging power. And I think you touched on something, right, in terms of the relationships, right, and the relationship building and how important um, that is in, in the organizing work and also in the legislative and public office work. So um, thank you for lifting that up. Javier, I wanted to uh, turn it to you, you know, as we think about how nonprofits build power and leverage power. And wanted to ask, you know, in terms of uh, partnership for community action, how are you all translating, you know, the work into effective policy? You know, what, what are you finding that is working for you all um, in terms of being able to push forward on some of the things that you all have um, been able to be successful on? And then where, you know, where are the roadblocks? that need to get out of the way um, so that you all can be more effective as, as nonprofit leaders of color? You know, I, I think one of the things that that, um, that bears mentioning is the fact that um, as an organization, we, we are not in a silo. We are part of an ecosystem. Uh, we are part of collaboratives and coalitions forward together in Centro, uh, uh, Centro Savila, South Alec Money Development Center. I mean, you name it, right? And, and there are these relationships that are sometimes issue-based, but for the most part, we're all in this together, building a movement of working people, of low-wage workers, of immigrants, of, of Black and Indigenous peoples across the city, in, in our case, right? There are others that do this statewide. Um, and, you know, I, I, we as an organization are very careful to, to, to not cross any ethical lines. The legal lines are well defined. You know, we all we all understand them as 51C3s, but there are ethical lines too, right, that, that, that we need to really keep in mind. And, you know, um, as an organization, um, we, we have uh, enacted policies that allow for our staff members to serve in, 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 in public service roles, whether it's state legislature or the board of a charter school or whatever the case might be. Uh, and at the same time, we have these walls set up. You know, when, when, when I am a legislator for 60 days or whatever, I am a legislator. Um, and I take that role very seriously. I've got viejitos that live down the street from me that voted for me, not because I'm a nonprofit leader, not because I'm a movement builder, but because they believe in me and what I can do for them as a legislator. So I've got to respect that piece of it. At the same time, as leaders of color in this nonprofit sector, uh, you know, we've got to keep those lines of communication open, right? And, and we all have a role to play. Uh, case in point, you know, the work that Adrienne was talking about, uh, New Mexico, uh, New Mexicans Together for Healthcare, right? Uh, you know, that, that is work that is critical to our communities, that is critical particularly to undocumented immigrants with regard to healthcare access. Uh, you know, I can play a supportive role. I don't have to be the person carrying legislation, right? They're much better, smarter, uh, veteranos, veteranas out there, they're doing incredible work. Um, and, and so, you know, I don't have to be everything to everyone, you know, but that communication is key because ultimately, uh, you know, our ability to serve in public office and our ability to continue to build this collective movement um, gets lost in, uh, in, in the shuffle of the politics, right? Uh, you know, not every vote I take as a legislator, the nonprofit ecosystem will agree with, right? And I've got a, I've got a long list. And I, I'm sure Commissioner Barbo is probably going to start to feel that, you know, the more votes she takes. And Representative Ortez, probably the same. And that's okay. You know, you don't have to, you don't have to check the progressive box on every single issue for that ecosystem to continue to thrive and get ahead, right? Uh, and I find that those the, the folks in that nonprofit sector that fully understand and appreciate that are actually the, some of the most effective advocacy players in the state, right? Because they understand the pragmatism that they've got to approach this work through. You know, uh, uh, the, the, there are some times we will disagree on the substance of the policy, right? And that's okay. We should talk about those disagreements. Uh, and we can decide to talk about them in a public space or a private space, right? Uh, depending on what's best for this movement. But it is okay to do that, right? And, and that is something that I think, especially young leaders that are coming up in this sector who want to serve in public office, it is okay to break from that, um, 
you know, from, from any one ideology, depending on the issue, depending on your constituents. Because again, I go back to that viejito, that viejito down the street, you know, and they could care less about the movement we're building. <laughs> they just want to make sure that they can put food on their table. They want to make sure their nietos are taken care of. They want to make sure the school down the street has resources that it needs to serve the kids in this neighborhood. Um, and, and they're your constituents and, and you've got to listen to them. I want to just, Thank you. if I can, pull on to Javier, uh, Representative Martinez's comments. Just, I, I think like it's, it's also an interesting thing for me in this role to be able to think of like, how do you be an effective legislator or just policymaker? And how are you an effective community organizer or an advocate or whatever? And those don't always because you could be radical and saying all the things, but if you can't pass legislation, <laughs> Um, so some of that, I really appreciate the word prag pragmatic today <laughs> um, and thinking about it and just like, right, that we we also want to be effective in both spaces. And um, I also saw um, Councillor Villarreal commenting. So, yeah, I think definitely value based, um, but still pragmatic to get what we how how and where can we be effective in both those spaces. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I was looking at that comment as well, right? And that is that balance, right? Of, you know, how are you staying true to your values, uh, accountable to your communities, to your nonprofit role, and also as a person who's in public office. So, uh, Christina, I wanted to hear your thoughts on, you know, when we think about um, the potential power of nonprofits, right, to impact uh, policy change and and what is at stake, right? In terms of this of this comment that was just put in there, um, and in particular, I'd like to hear from you. You know, what what do you see ahead for the nonprofit um, sector and the the this rising tide of of elected leaders of of color? That, that, thank you. That, there's a lot to unpack with that question, but you know, I, I will say I knew the power of nonprofits as a nonprofit leader. You know, I, I, I knew the I knew that power in my own community, right? Because we do a lot of work that local government cannot do. And we're often vilified for it, at least in my community. It's really, really hard for me to take as a nonprofit leader uh, when I'm when I'm I hear you know, things about nonprofits being um, terrible, you know, just wanting all the money from government. And it's just, we just know that that doesn't happen. That's not true. We're, we're doing the things that government needs to do uh, that, that they're not. So I just want to say that that's sort of the universe that I'm playing in up here, right? Um, and I knew our power, but I didn't really truly understand that power until the legislative ses session began, you know, and I'm coming in, you know, to this new, uh, and the not the nonprofits and the collaboratives have worked for so long for years on issues leading the charge because we have no staff because we're unpaid legislatures we're looking at the nonprofit community right to like you know to advance legislation to build build that uh, you know community power through organizing you know to take that to the legislator legislators to make that decision so like it the power of the nonprofit world is it, it's really um, overwhelming in some ways in, in a good way like we need each other to you know to push legislation forward so that was a beautiful thing for me to see um, I think that if we want to we, and we need to, we, you're, we're not going to have a paid legislature like that, right? It's going gonna, it's gonna to take some time for it to happen. So, you know, we're going to have to continually feed each other, you know, and, and work together to, you know, to build support for legislation in community. And, and it's, it's, iter, it's an iterative process, right? So I think what we have to get comfortable with is, you know, like for me, the discomfort of someone saying, you know, oh, you know, this is a conflict of, of interest. You work on protecting land, and here you want the, the state government to provide funding for protecting land. That's a conflict of interest. It's like, well, there are plenty of oil and gas attorneys and owners of companies in the legislator, legislature, but we're not saying, oh, that's a conflict of interest. You can't work on that. But we're saying, but we're so hard on ourselves, right? And the progressive community is hard on the progressive community, and we ask these questions. I think we have to we have to have a real conversation about what that looks like, right? Um, we have to, as I, I think as a nonprofit community, and I'm talking to boards and foundations, get comfortable with 
your leaders having holding elected positions and figure out how to be flexible enough for them to to be able to do that be clear with yourselves about what you need but support that because the power of the movement is you know not only in the community but in the who's making the decisions right the decision makers so let's get our people who care about our issues into those places of power right and as board as a board support those people right and as foundations really support those people by, I don't know, expanding the grant terms, for instance, right? And saying like, instead of your one-year grant, here's a four-year grant. Now, oh, hey, you can use this for salaries for not the person doing the programming, but the person who's doing the payroll, right? That is how you build movement in a nonprofit is that you support all levels, not just the, you know, the fancy, sexy programming person, but everybody who makes a nonprofit work, right? More money, money for collaborative, you know, money for, you know, for capacity and, you know, give us the time. Don't make us, you know, apply every six months. Give us a four-year grant. I'm going to stop there because I have a lot of ideas about this. (laughs) Well, I'm yeah. going to let Adrienne go and then uh, and Javier too. And then I wanted to just let folks know that we will have a few minutes here for some Q&A. So feel free to drop into the chat uh, questions that you have for our panelists. But go ahead, Adrienne. Yeah, I think we really need to talk about it. I'm so thankful for Rep. Zavorka is bringing this up. I also, in my organizing work, right, and it's actually one of the reasons why and how I first came to know Building Movement, Pro- Building Movement Project is because of that same work that I've I've said for I used to work service delivery right and do direct service with young people and foster care and navigating the juvenile justice system, and I used to and um, part of when I started working and opened the Strong Families New Mexico office it was like we really need to be tapping in to those direct service providers where there's also a myth right that folks that are doing direct service or on the closest to the ground are our C3 can't be talking legislatively when actually there's next to the person directly impacted, they are the next best thing, right? Because they've actually are working day to day with those groups and communities. So I do think as a building movement project conversation, that this like conversation around how and where and those barriers that are pulled up and we hold to them as social justice organizations, but yet we see like just like Representative Ortez are speaking around big oil and gas or not really the difference between church and state when we look at religious uh, um, organizations. So um, I just had to jump on that one too. Go have it. I know we had this conversation yeah. this week too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, just briefly look um, uh, to Councilor Villarreal's point. I, I think she's right. I mean, I think the values do have to be aligned and I'll give you guys a real quick example, real brief story. Uh, but in 20, 2011, when uh, the previous governor came into office, she made it her calling to uh, to end this state practice of allowing undocumented people to to get a driver's license, right? And serve sort of a part of a national movement. And New Mexico was actually one of two states that held the line, us in Washington State, um, in in big big part due to the to this movement, right? Organizations that came together and were holding the line, even when even when Republicans and a majority of Democrats were against us and in support of that policy, we, we held the line. Now, in 2016, uh, when, when everybody, including Republic, Republicans, were getting tired of this issue, there was a compromise on the table, right, to, to effectively end the practice of giving driver's licenses, but replacing it with, at the time, what it was, a, a driver's certificate, right? And we brought together this coalition of groups uh, and I think all but one or two of them said, this is a good deal. It's a good pragmatic deal. Let's stake it. And then we will fix it. Well, long story short, it has been fixed effectively. Uh, even though there were, I think it was one organization at most and like a couple of activists who were really mad at us as legislators and at the movement for quote unquote, taking the deal. When in fact, it was probably one of the best moves, strategic moves we made, right? So absolutely, we have to be true to these values, but once you're in that coliseum, right? Once the sausage is being made or or the chorizo is being made, if you will, you know, there are a lot of moving parts, right? And you've got to sort of take both 
you know, a, a one or two year, three year outlook, and then what the 20 year outlook is. And we've got to be able to envision that. Otherwise we are reacting. Otherwise we are that symbol of progressive champion in the chamber and we are not delivering anything for the people. And that is my worst fear when it comes to this movement and the movement, uh, you know, getting people like us elected into public office. Thank you. Um, I opened it up for questions and we have one here that came in and it is, how do we support elected leaders of color to push our local city and county and state for more progressive solutions to the problems in our communities that address root causes and systems change? And we can just pop for now if you all want to. Um, you know, I, I think that. answering a, answering those phone calls, um, you know, a, answering the, you know, uh, participating in, in Chismes con Barboa, you know, the, the, the fantastic uh, uh, constituent outreach that, that you have, you know, coming to our town halls, whether it's on, on Zoom, Facebook Live, or in our communities, uh, you know, uh, pitching in those five or $10 when, when you get the call and you're asked to do it. And if you could do a little bit more, do a little bit more. All of that really truly helps us, I think, shape the bodies in which we're in, not only by bringing in these, these, uh, these smart, progressive, uh, root cause uh, driving uh, policy proposals, but also by surrounding ourselves and getting people elected to these same bodies who share in that perspective and, and who, if nothing else, are open to learning, right? I can't tell you the number of legislators that Reportes and I uh, serve with who are not a part of these movements. They don't come through these like social determinants of health type of trainings to their policymaking roles, but they're very open to them, right? And, and I can tell you example after example of folks who say, okay, huh, I thought, you know, I thought, I thought healthcare was just like, funding the healthcare to go see the doctor. I never really understood that it goes far beyond that. And they become champions in their own right and in their own communities. Uh, I'd love Excellent to- point, Javier. Piggy, I'd like to piggyback on that. You know, uh, it, it's awesome that in Albuquerque and Berlino County folks seem to be working really closely together. It's not so much in, in Northern New Mexico. You know, we've got some barriers here, um, you know, mostly philosophical, but but what with COVID-19, we had this new thing happen where we created this uh, collaborative community uh, organizations active in disaster. We were focused on what to do, how to help community members uh, uh, along, along, you know, along a lot of things, housing, food, you know, um, healthcare, all, all of that. And we were all working together, community organizations and elected officials. And I wasn't an elected official when I started, uh, on this thing, but we all have this agreement, right? That we are coming together out of respect and that everybody is as important as the, as the other, you know, all in this group. And so I think that it's really important to have agreement, right? With our elected officials. Like if we're engaged, we have to engage in collaborative. We have to agree that we're going to respect each other and work forward together. Uh, but we really have to just elect more people who are like us and also, you know, who, who share our values but also pay attention to the staffing, you know, within cities and counties, you know, and at the state level, because those are the folks that are making things happen, right? And so we also have to present that as an option, you know, public administration as an option for people where you can, you know, support your family and yourself, but also make real change happen, right? Those staff positions are really, really important. And I just... Jump in quickly, Faye, I agree with everything. I think that, like I said at the beginning, we have to be everywhere um, because I used to say a long time, I like, we can have the, in fact, we do in a lot of instances have some of the best policies on the books and it never hits the ground if we don't have the mechanism in which it's implementing or the state and local governments that are going to really see it through to what that beautiful piece of legislation is saying, right? <clears throat> um, and I think to the supporting leaders of color, I, um, you know, I, again, got to do some of the work we, because we got to invest in um, what they call unlikely voters or people that aren't engaged. I call it myth busting, right? Like all we hear everywhere is that um, communities of color are apathetic. They don't care. They don't want to be involved. Um, but guess what? I've knocked on so many doors when we got, when we target those 
unlikely voters or people who aren't your everyday engaged. And they said, I've lived in this house for 25 years. I'm going to vote now because you came to my door. Nobody has ever come to my door before. Or I, or like people tell me that rural communities don't care and aren't going to come out. We have hundreds of people coming to our meetings in rural McKinley County and rural Doniana counties because we provide a good meal and give them all the space they need to have their voices heard. They want to be heard. People want to share their voices. So when you're engaged and involved, who who do you know? Who's nearest to you that you could bring engaged and involved to? And then that accountability, like I also learned from my good friend Andrea Quijada, right? Like identifiers like race, class, and gender aren't always the Sometimes we've, in fact, in part of one of your questions, it was like, what is it like being a leader of color? Well, in New Mexico, we've been the leaders, at least Chicanos, Hispanos, Mexicanos. We have been in leadership for long time. And that doesn't always equal, um, equal what we need. So pushing on how do we build those values that where we're moving together, where we're informed together, um, and, and playing this big Big bad game, learning that process together um, and moving together and accountable to those communities is, um, is what I'm excited. Thank you, for, kind of. thank you for lifting that up, Adrienne. I think that's a really great point. And New Mexico is different in that way, uh, you know, compared to nationally. I wanted uh, to address one last question in the chat before we start moving to our wrap up. Uh, this is a question. There's a lot of national hand wringing about political polarization. How has moving into elected positions impacted your thinking about this topic? And do you think of it differently when in your nonprofit organizer advocate role? So quick thoughts on that before we move to wrap up. I'm pointing to wrap my penis. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, look, um, I, I, I mean, there is polarization, uh, obviously, um, I, within the legislative body. Um, uh, the closer you get to the committee process, um, at least in my experience, like we, we work pretty well together, honestly. Like it's not until the lights are on and the chambers are with their mics on that people get all, you know, they draw their lines. For the most part, we're pretty well together, especially on the fiscal stuff. Like I, I feel like we, we all kind of move in the same direction more or less. Um, I think in the nonprofit sector, though, I, I think it's actually more bipartisan than we'd like to admit. Um, you know, I can tell you from my perspective, uh, even though our work uh, for the last 10 years or so has been working with uh, with immigrants, with young children, and sort of we've taken that frame, uh, we work with most everybody, anybody who wants to, everybody who shares in that spirit is welcome to work with us. Um, and in a way, I feel like that's a good thing because people, uh, organizations like ours are on the ground. And I feel like there's probably a little less polarization once they're at that ground level, like your vecinos, like, you know, the, you go to the same church together, your kids go to the same school together. Um, and once you start talking politics, then you realize that that person maybe voted for Trump and maybe this one voted for Biden. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, you're worshiping the same place, you, your kids go to the same school, your neighbors and you care for one another. That's not to say that we don't have these acts of hate that we've seen and, and it's more and more now because there are these like weird political lines being followed especially at the national level uh, but I feel like New Mexico is in a different place than most other places uh, and, and I think that is a as, a as movement building organizations we, we do need to lift that up uh, to the extent that we can because I don't like it for us to be tagged as like lefty liberals who will always vote for the Democrats like that might be the case more so now because of Trump but I can tell you that's not the case everywhere. And it's not the case all the time, especially when you actually have reasonable Republicans uh, who, who, who are willing to do the right thing. I mean, working families tax credit at the national level, that's a Republican idea. And it's actually a really good idea. Like 40 years later, the data show that it's one of the best poverty alleviation measures you can, we've enacted. And it was a Republican idea of all, of all ideas. So yeah, uh, it's it's it stinks that it's there at the national level, but uh, you know I'm hopeful that that we're we're gonna get past it. Thank you, Javier. Any last thoughts before we move towards our wrap up on this particular question? Just any, real quick, I those was, words of advice to folks. <laughs> I, I was no, I don't have any of that, but I will say that I was very surprised of the collegiality and committee and how 
the, it, the pure theater in debate. That was something that I was not prepared for. Like, hey, but you said you'd like my bill. And then now you're, you're dogging it. You didn't tell me any of these things in comedy. I could have made it better then. Uh, so that was exciting and interesting. Awesome. Well, thank you. Let me throw one last thing on. I, I, I got to say this because Reportes is totally right. Um, and also, uh, uh, I've never heard the phrase institutional racism or race or racism used more by Republicans than ever before. And I, I, I still, I, their leadership, I think, is still trying to grasp it. Like they weren't like, yay, let's get rid of racism, right? They don't really know what it means. They don't, but, but they're using the language. And, and, and some of the most critical bills, so two bills, working families tax credit, and then the other one was House Bill, I think it was, uh, uh, I think it was House Bill 112. Was it the indigent? Yeah, House Bill 112. Indigent yeah, I was going to give shout out. Yeah. So to those two bills. My penis. The, the, those two bills were specifically targeting immigrants. Like the House Bill 112 specifically literally says indigent care programs across the state can no longer discriminate on the basis of immigration. Passed both chambers unanimously. Not not unanimously. one anti-immigrant anti word was spoken by the other side. Uh, which to mm. me, holy That's cow, we've made some progress. Because if you all remember 2011, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Immigrants were traffickers, child traffickers, drug cartel members, murderers, all the bad mm -hmm. things you can think mm -hmm. of. Wow. I need to just well, say really quickly that it was Representative Javier was the sponsor of that bill, Representative Martinez. And I think it's that, to again, back to my, we need to be everywhere and all approaches necessary, right? Like his relationships within the legislature, the years of community and organizations working towards that, like it just can't, to have that bill go through unanimously on both chambers, I was gonna shout out to it. You beat me to it, might be next book. So that's what he wow, was the sponsor. He, he humbly did not mention that he was the sponsor and creator of that bill. So. Well, okay, we are at time. I have two quick slides to share some resources with you. But before that, I just really want to, again, express my gratitude to, to the three of you for taking the time today and being so honest and thoughtful in your responses. Uh, we really, really appreciate uh, your time and energy, the work that you do for New Mexico families and, and for your communities. I uh, wanted to share uh, a couple of slides that have some resources from Building Movement Project. Um, and so I think Catherine can put those up now. So again, as I mentioned, if you go to uh, these particular websites, you can download the reports that we've done on uh, COVID-19 and its impact on people of color. You can um, download the Race to Lead report at racetolead.org. Um, so that's information for all of you. And um, I think we've got one more slide, if I'm not mistaken here. Or that might be it. Okay. Well, I, again, am grateful to all of you uh, for your time. Thanks to everyone who joined us today. We will be sending out an email with links to um, this webinar and sharing it on our website. So once again, Thank you, everyone, for your time. Appreciate it. Bye. Good to see you, you all. Thank you.